Amen. Well, I am Brother Boyd Collins. I am a mountain preacher. And uh, you're saying amen now. We'll see after a while. Amen. <laughs> Might want to hold your mule before it gets out of the barn. But uh, when I was uh, <clears throat> 18 years old, God called me to preach. And I ran for the call of God on my life for 10 years. And, uh, but God never quit, never gave up on me. And uh, at 28, I surrendered everything. And by 30, I was pastoring a little old mountain church. And uh, been at this ever since. Been in the tent ministry for uh, 15 years evangelism 16 years, pastored for seven years, and in that time of 10 evangelism, uh, I was a part of a church that uh, we'd met Brother Fisher, and uh, he wanted me and my pastor to come to San Diego to present a ministry of the Appalachian Ministries out there, and so that's how I first went to San Diego, and in the process of going out there, I meet this jaybird, and, and God just kind of makes some things click, because he says he's from West Virginia, and uh, sure enough, find out he's been a part of a church in Parkersburg, which is about an hour from where we've been for 15 years, but we've never met, never crossed paths in all that time he was there. So it took a boy from Tennessee to go to West Virginia to take a guy from West Virginia to San Diego. Y'all keeping notes, right? There'll be a quiz at the end. <clears throat> For us to cross paths, for now us to get to Michigan, to where he's pastoring to bring a missionary from Thailand. Come on. Like now, y'all got all that, right? That's how God does things. Can't explain it. That's just the way he does things. Amen? But if you got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 4, 6. I'm going to give you a verse that God gave me when I struggled about the tent ministry. I pastored a little mountain church here in East Tennessee where I was raised for several years. And... Uh, about the sixth year I was there, we did a tent revival at our church. And in the process of doing that, God began to smite my heart about the tent ministry and, and bringing back the old-time old way of tent revivals. Got to talking to my people in my church, and even the elder in my church could not remember the last time they'd ever seen a tent revival or even an old Brush Arbor meeting. And God began to prick my heart about those mountain churches, mountain people, I don't know about how it is up here, but them mountain people, they're not going to go across the next mountain uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. And what we want to do is bring people together in those tents to hold old-time camp meeting and tent revivals. Now, camp meeting, if you study anything about your history, is a time of refreshing for the saints of God. Yes. Folks would come in uh, from hundreds of miles and come and camp for weeks and they'd pray and preach and sing and beg for God to show up to get a refiring and revival and refreshing to go back to their appointed places to serve God for another year. And that's still what camp meeting's about. Some guys have forgotten that, but that's what camp meeting is all about. Yeah. If folks get saved, that's icing on the cake. Amen? But that's what God has smote our heart. And he gave us this verse, Isaiah 4, 6, and he says, And there shall be a tabernacle, a tent, if you please, for a shadow in the daytime for the, from the heat, and for a place of refuge and for a cover from storm and from rain. And that's been our desire to bring tents uh, to churches or maybe accumulated churches come together. And we put that tent up and God's people come for a season, for a time. If it's three or four days a week, we've held one meeting in Kennard, Indiana, ran six weeks. And uh, you say, yeah, unheard of anymore. And uh, seeing God do some miraculous things. But uh, that's true. That tent is a place for you to come and get out of the out of the worries of the world, and there's something different about a tent. These folks will come and get under that tent, will never walk in this building That's right. uh, because of what this represents. They say this is, intimidates them, but it also brings out all the weirdos. Yes. It really does. I could tell you some stories. We could be here till this time tomorrow, and I could tell you some stories about weirdos showing up at my tent, amen. And my wife says I have a neon sign on my forehead, forehead it flashes weirdo, weirdo. I just attract them from everywhere, amen. But we've been doing that for 15 years, been on the road. Basically, our kids have been raised in it. I was talking last night, my baby boy, he's 17 years old. He knows nothing else. He was raised on sawdust, sawdust on the ground with a baby blanket or whatever to is old enough to walk. It's all he knows. 
And he's running the sound system tonight under the tent in Highland Hills Baptist Church with Pastor Mario Shadine. And I encourage you, if you can, come out tomorrow night or Friday night. If you've never been to an old-fashioned tent meeting, I'll guarantee you it'll be something you'll never forget. Tuesday morning, we're having morning and evening services. Yesterday morning, the Spirit of God blew through that place, and we never even had a preacher. He said, now, how are you having a meeting without a preacher? Well, when the big preacher shows up, you don't need a preacher. When the Spirit of God moves in a place, and everybody in the place knows he's there, as old man of God in them mountains, Earl Hughes used to say, there's no use trying to sow seed when the wind's blowing. And why would a man try to get up and outdo what God's already done? Amen. So you please try to come if you can. Kind of give you a taste, kind of give you a mindset. If the pastor uh, decides he wants to come bring that tent, kind of what it'll be. Uh, I've got a feeling he'll probably want to try to do a tent revival before he wants to try to take on a camp meeting. Uh, that entails a whole lot of different intricate parts. But uh, in the process of this, three years ago, I was, in, uh, was doing a tent meeting, a camp meeting in Hagerstown, Maryland. And there was a fellow there with GLBM, Golden Land Baptist Missions. His name was Bob DeWitt. And we'd had a Wednesday night service, and the pastor's son had got saved, and just, just a miraculous service. God was all over the place, and the service ran about 10, 10.30 that night. And uh, folks was crying and snotting and carrying on all around the tent half the night. And me and Bob was sitting up on the platform, and, and uh, just, you ever had the Spirit of God just wear you out? I mean, get to the place that you're just drained physically. And me and him both were sitting there, and I was looking up on the top of that old blue and white tent, and he started laughing. That's when Bob gets uh, happy and full of God, he starts laughing. And he slaps me on the knee, and he says, Preacher, you ought to take this tent to Thailand when I go back in November. And I looked at him, and I said, Well, Bob, that's crazy. I said, If I was going to do something like that, I'd just ask God to bring the, provide the money instead of taking a tent eight years old. I'd just see if God wouldn't buy a brand new one and ship it over there. He jumps up and says, praise God, brother, that's even better. Let's just pray that way. Guess what? I'd open my mouth and got put on the spot. So we began to pray that way. Now, this was in uh, August. In November, I was on an airplane leaving JFK Airport, and the tent was already in Thailand. God had already provided the money to buy a $6,000 tent. Provided the money to ship it over there, paid for my plane tickets and expenses for three and a half weeks to get there. And uh, when we got there with a the tent, we met Brother Manny's or Brother Roy's pastor, Brother Manny, and uh, we went to put the tent up. And this guy was kind of stand, like he does, he'll stand back and watch, and observe. But when he puts his hands to the plow, he means business. And I told Brother Manny, I said, This guy right here is who needs to take care of this tent. When we leave, he's got a heart for it, and he's a worker. And that was Brother Roy Delacruz. And he's had, uh, took care of that tent in Thailand. We've got one on the West Coast, Brother Jason Brown. Matter of fact, I'll be out there Amen. the end of this month through the 6th of July doing another tent revival out there at Lakeside. And God has expounded our borders. But this guy right here, he's the real deal. So for the next little while, you give him his ear and let him give you his burden uh, he's wanting to plant a church uh, to reach the Thai and Burmese. They're right on the border. And he's got a precious wife and a little three-year-old boy, and he's been here 40-some-odd days, and I know he's homesick, but he's also got a broken heart for a lost and dying world in Thailand and in Burma. So give him your ear, and I hopefully he gets your heart before he's done. Come on, Brother Roy. Brother Roy Delacruz. This is Filipino size. Okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, good evening. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here. Preacher, thank you for the privilege that I could share my burden. And I'm so honored to be with Brother Boy Collins. I called him as my father. I don't know, I don't know if he's honored to call me his son. But uh, I got saved year 1995. I was born in a Catholic home, and my mom and my dad, my, the whole members of the family, they called me the black sheep because I got saved. 
And it's crazy because when I was in the world and doing the things of the world, it's just okay for them. And then when I got saved, that's where they got mad at me. And I told them about how God has called me, and I, I know that God has called me to serve him, but they don't want it. I remember one night my brother came into my room, drunk, and he beat me. And then he gave his throw to me my suitcase, suitcase, and then he said, go leave this house. We don't need you here anymore. But I just followed God's will in my life. 2000, I enrolled in Bible school. And let me thank you because I was trained under an American missionary. And what you see right now is the fruit of American missions. I'm so thankful for you guys for sending missionary in my country. On behalf of Filipinos, I'm so thankful that you help our country, but you gave us the very important thing, and that is the Word of God. This is my story why my wife and I went to Thailand 2007. After our wedding, we went to Thailand, but not knowing that we will be a missionary. And God has gave us a job. My wife and I, we work at school. And at the same time, we have that one desire, and that is to help the missionary that works there, a Filipino missionary. And by the way, he's my brother-in-law. But this is what God will do and does in our lives there. 2010, 2007, I start working secular at the same time helping the church. But the more you get involved in the ministry, the more God will show you his will. Amen. And what Jeremiah said, your eyes affects your what? Heart. Your heart. There, not only God, not only our eyes affect our hearts, but also affects our stomach <laughs> because we love the food there. But this one experience that God showed me that God wants me to serve these people. One Saturday, most, I, I shared this already in the church there, but one Saturday, we're, we're out for soul winning. And we do, preacher, what you did here, door knocking, we, we go. With, but I have interpreter with me because I work with the Burmese and the Thai people. So two, two kinds of, of people and different languages. So I use interpreter to the Burmese. And we went this, to this small village, small, t small village, and we start, start door knocking. And I met this lady, I'm sorry to say, but she looks so old. But when I asked her how old is she, she's 55 years old. This is how hard life in Asia, especially in Burma, where really, if, if you want to see a real hard life, and if you want to experience a real hard life, go with me in the border. And, you will thank God how God has blessed your country and how God has blessed your life here in America. And you are blessed by God. You are blessed by God. Thank God for that. But as we shared the gospel to this lady, she told us that she came from Burma and crossed the border because she looks for um, a good hospital that could help her because she is, she is sick. But she, she was thinking that we're doctors because we're giving something and we're passing out trucks and we're knocking doors. And then I told her, ma'am, we're not doctors, but I will share something to you and someone to you who is the great physician and the doctor of all doctors. And I start talking to her about Jesus Christ, preacher. And I start talking to her about Jesus Christ. As we continue sharing to her the gospel, this Buddhist lady received Jesus Christ as her Savior. But this words that changed me totally. She said this, Sir, I am 55 years old, but I've never heard that name of Jesus. This is the first time for me to hear that name of Jesus. I said, Lord, it's not fair. It's not fair. Because these people here, they've been here for a long time, but they never heard the name of Jesus. In the Philippines, we hear that almost every day. I'm sure here in America, and sometimes people use that in cussing. 
But there are people outside there that they never heard that name of Jesus Christ. And that just one time, I thought that this is a joke preacher, but many times we encountered, we went to villages, and these people were just first time for them to see the Bible, first time for them to hear that name of Jesus Christ. And they need someone. What the book of Romans says in chapter 10, he said, and how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? Thailand is a Buddhist country the same as Burma. And if you will talk to them about the Bible, about Jesus Christ, they don't know it. But we believe that faith cometh by hearing and by hearing of the word of God. Amen. When Brother Boyd went there in the tent, we, we filled that tent with 1,500 people. Yes, Say, so how, how did you do that? We didn't use chairs. We just put mats and they let them sit there. But these people are hungry for the word of God. Many of them received, raised their hand and received Jesus Christ as their Savior. He said, are they saved? I don't know. But this is one thing. They hear the gospel. They hear the gospel. Two months before coming here, we held our first youth camp in our church. And we put up that tent and they said, oh, the circus tent is here. <laughs> they thought that a circus is coming in town. But we put up that tent and we have 80 young people came. And 30 of them received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Friend, let me tell you this. The harvest truly is plenteous. And Christians here, let me tell you, I am a fruit of your mission. Now you gave us this. And now it's time to bring this to another people that never heard the gospel. What I'm asking you is your help to please pray for us and please help us. Let me close this story. One missionary came to inside Burma and started passing out tracts, preacher, and shared the gospel to every people that he saw. One lady, after she shared the, he shared the gospel to that lady and said, The Mormons are here. The Jehovah's Witnesses are already here. The Seventh Day are already here. What took you so long? What took us so long, Baptists, to conquer that place? Because it's hard to raise money in our churches. It's hard. To convince people that there are people out there that needs the gospel, that needs Jesus Christ. We're so comfortable sitting in our chairs, in our pews, and we don't care about any, we don't care about people out there. But let me tell you this, we are willing to go. When my mom, I told my mom and my dad, I said, we're, we're, going, we're, we're, we're going to be a missionary here in the border. He said, why in the border? Are there people there? Our place is a small town called Mesa, but more than half a million people there, preacher. And as I said, the Jehovah's Witnesses are there. But God has done a great things in our ministry there. I wish I could bring you all there and see what's going on in the border. We have Muslims got saved. How you say got saved? They are now faithful in our church. We have one lady a Muslim teacher in our school, and we have this rule. She said, our rule is this. If you want to teach in our school, because we have migrant school, you need to be in our church. So she came to our church. Now that lady is bringing her neighbors to our church. One guy named Joseph. Joseph is a Muslim guy. But Joseph got saved, and he was crippled. He just pushed his wheelchair preacher. But you know what? This guy go to that village 20 miles away from our church by his wheelchair to do soul winning. I've never seen a guy a soul winner as Joseph. He goes there one day. He sleeps there because it's too hard for him to come back. And another day, he will just do his wheelchair coming back to our church. He is now in our Bible Institute. Joseph has a heart for souls. Yes. This is what he said to me. Pastor, when I was a Muslim, I am not afraid to tell people about my faith. And I know it's wrong. Now I am saved. 
Now I know that Jesus Christ is the truth. Now I know that I'm in the truth. I'm not afraid to tell these people about Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, I go with him Saturday. I told him, Joseph, stop now. It's, I'm tired. He said, let's keep on, preacher. Let's keep on. <laughs> I've never seen a soul winner like Joseph. But please pray for our ministry. I'm here representing the people of Thailand and people of Myanmar. And let me tell you this. It's not fair for my people to go to hell without one time hearing the gospel. I'm sharing you my heart tonight. We are starting a new ministry in another town, which is an hour away from our place right now. And I am here raising support for that and raising money for the vehicle that we needed in going to that place. Friend, Thailand is a spirit worshiper country. Has been under Buddhism for hundreds of years. The same with Burma. We have the light. And we are conquering their land. Amen. Thank you so much, preacher. just wonder <clears throat> how many of us sit in our pews tonight while he was talking about his burden for souls, what God's done in his heart. Take a good look at your life. How concerned are you about souls? I must Heather to come to the piano and let's all stand, heads bowed, eyes closed. She's going to start playing. And I think before we go any further in the, audit, in the service, I think we need to open the altar. Would you be willing to come and kneel at the altar and say, God, would you examine me and my passion, concern for the lost? I'm talking about your personal soul winning. I'm talking about your missions giving. How concerned are you about a world that's dying without Christ? And somebody needs to tell them, whether it's your neighbor across the street or whether it's where Brother Dela Cruz is about to go where they've never even heard the name of Christ. Heather, go ahead.